Basta you looking a little um dark side right now. Oh, there we go. Okay, Basila, this is very offensive and I'm gonna need you to stop. Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic and Knights of the Old Republic 2 The Sith Lords. Fantastic RPG games from Bioware and Obsidian, dearly beloved by fans. So much that the first one's even getting a remake for a release date far, far away. These games have both been acclaimed and upheld by fans for years now, and we're so lucky to live in a world where gaming communities have such passionate and talented individuals willing to further maintain and improve the grand worlds game developers have created by the way of mods. And no mod for the KOTOR series has made me truly appreciate the ingenuity of the wacky modding community as much as the Brotherhood of Shadow, Solomon's Revenge. Brotherhood of Shadow and Solomon's Revenge takes the player on an additional journey and storyline filled with its own new cast of characters, lore based on the already established game history, custom items, areas, voice acting, and more. The expansion storyline is available to be played after the Leviathan section of the main game, and begins on Korriban by talking to a Rodian NPC who asks you to do a favor for him. It seems like a pretty inconspicuous start to what is an 8 plus hour wild ride. In carrying out the favor, you come into contact with one Daemon Drexel, or Demon Drexel as I like to call him, who like many NPCs in the game, gets all grumpy and tries to beat up your protagonist. <laughs> do it again, do it again. After getting thrashed, he runs away, and you report back to your Rodian acquaintance who gives you another chore, which takes place aboard his cruise ship, the Orion, to smuggle some cargo. For being a basic template of a KOTOR Republic ship, the Orion's got a lot of personality, is filled with life, NPCs, creatures, and dialogue that makes it feel more engrossing than a lot of places in the main game. The woman was too stunned to speak. <laughs> Why would you do that? Among them are great characters such as Disgruntled Mechanic, Useless Captain, Sarah Degana, Happy Funtime Mandalorian, and the cute little droids that roam the ship that the game has a vicious vendetta against. After getting to know your new band of misfits, Naturally, Damon Drexel returns, attempting to steal the mysterious cargo. His men attempt to beat up your protagonist, and obviously fail, but it comes at the price of Happy Funtime Mandalorian, which was a cost far too great for this galaxy. Someone touches the cargo we're supposed to be smuggling a bit too hard, and suddenly everything goes all space horror. The ship gets infested with some ancient source of evil that really, really, really wants the main character's body. This sends us into a sequence of self-discovery and flashbacks, ultimately ending in this totally unfair yet totally doable fight where the evil shadow entity tries to beat up the protagonist. When that doesn't work, it tries to blind us with excessive lighting effects and loud audio, which almost works. When we return from the land of body snatchers, we beat up the magical protector of the cargo so that it can never harass young talented women ever again, and as soon as we do, Sarah Degana strolls in, announcing that she is in fact an assassin who worked for our protagonist in the time before the game even began. She now reclaims her old name from when she was in our service, and so Sarah Degana is now Shadow once again. With that, we get off this godforsaken ship. And so at last, you have come. Oh my god. Some loser walks up to us and says that Shadows, formerly known as Sarah Degana's, old master, ordered him to try and beat up the protagonist. Uh -huh. He promised me great power. He also calls her Matilda, which we learned from a flashback was the name she carried before she was even an assassin. So after taking care of him, we are now concerned about why Shadow, formerly known as Sarah Degana, aka Matilda's master, is targeting us. So we go on a quest to a completely new part of the planet to find him and ask him to stop trying to get people to beat us up, politely with no violence. In order to get there, we need to do a series of classic Bioware tasks that will offer us a path through Zerka Corporation's mining tunnels. I need credit for spice. And to help us do that is, unapologetically, the best character in the game, Kobayashi. And his droid verbal. Every day you discover new ways to support me. 
they get us into the residential level for Zerka, and after putting down several employees that wanted to beat up the protagonist, we finally make it to the Korriban Wastes, a barren land infested with some fearsome creatures which the droid casually slaps in the face. But when we get to the Temple that Shadow, formerly known as Seradaga, aka Matilda's master is hiding behind, it, Kobayashi sees that it's impossible to open, so naturally we have to go on a quest to find some sort of key or switch or nah just kidding, the protagonist just opens the door because she's that special. So. We get to Shadow, formerly known as Seradagana aka Matilda's old master, who reveals that he's upset because we stole a student from him long ago and turned her into an assassin in the Mandalorian Wars. Cause you know, we're cool like that. He tries to beat up the protagonist, but when he fails, he lets us know that he got help from the body snatchers with the obnoxious visual effects. Oh, I see. I see where this is going. So instead of beating us up, they use their effects to put us into an epileptic seizure and put us in cages while taking Shadow, formerly known as Serdagana aka Matilda. He also reveals that Matilda was just the name he gave to her after he had taken her in. Her original name was Shauna May. Now that the protagonist and Kobayashi have been captured, the only one who can save them is none other than Kobayashi's droid, Verbal, who must now Metal Gear his way through this creepy temple cause for some reason these guys' punches really freaking hurt. Verbal, come in! Answer me, you stupid droid! When the droid succeeds, we get suited up and are ready to embark on an epic battle to save Shana Mei slash Shadow, formerly known as Seradagana aka Matilda. Also, the mechanic is here for some reason. Awaken Shadow and claim your prize of flesh. Several explosions later, we stop the antagonist from beating us up, but then the previous body snatcher antagonist is reawakened and makes us fight everything, everywhere, all at once. Meanwhile, Shana Mei slash Shadow, formerly known as Seradagana aka Matilda, Protector of the realm, the Princess of the Seven Kingdoms, Queen of the Andals and the First Men, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, Mother of Dragons, Breaker of Chains, and all that, is fighting her old master and finally gets him to realize that he needs to let go and she needs to become her own person. Her master defeated and her new life with her crew looking brighter than ever, Shana Mei slash Shadow, formerly known as Sarah Degana has become her true self. Just Sarah Degana. Thank Christ. The Orion's crew walks off and leaves our protagonist to stare off into the sunset, annoyed with how much walking she'll have to do to get out of this damn place. The writing is fair for what you'd expect for a fan project, and isn't half bad. There are some missteps and places which lay things on a bit too thick. I have waited for you, the root of all my sorrow. But overall it's written with heart and a point. The dialogue among the characters, especially the Orion's crew, is the real treat here. What's wrong with you? Why did you just shoot my droid in the face? They are, as far as I'm concerned, the lifeblood of this expansion. And oh how lovable this small motley crew was despite being stacked up to other fan faves like Jolie or HK47. The antagonist's writing is less so. They're on the more serious side of things, so them spewing their lores and backstories may not be the greatest sit through, especially if you're taking voice acting into the equation. You will not survive beyond this If any of you have been through the Sith Lords Restored content mod, you'll be familiar with those moments where you just know for a fact that the galactic basic voice lines were fan made. In a lot of these areas, the mic audio quality for the voice acting isn't great, so your immersion may immediately be shot because of it. And it doesn't help that in some cases, the acting doesn't really hit that well. Welcome to the Battle of Malachor V, Revan. In some cases, the cheesy deliveries feel appropriate, in others, not so much. It becomes too transparent to totally ignore, especially for the main antagonist who has several lines. Surely you must have known that this confrontation was inevitable. Thankfully, most of the voice lines are spoken in the common alien language of the game, so kudos to the dev team for making use of that little advantage as much as humanly possible. When it comes to the music, I can't say much about the tracks that were used because I admittedly replaced the in-game soundtrack with a custom one of my choosing. But what I can say is that the mod used a good variety of tracks that, based on where they usually play in the main game, they offered a good match for the tone that the scenes tried to convey. Oh boy, sound effects. 
Jesus Christ! Generally, the mod places sounds where you'd expect sounds to be placed. They really pack a punch when used sparingly at appropriate times, but the only problem was how much of it was used. Anytime the body snatchers did their whole epileptic light show, a sound bite played for every single effect on the screen, which was absolutely deafening. Since these scenes go on for a while, and are sometimes even played over the voice lines, the mixing of it all just makes for set pieces that you really just wish would be over already. What? And the same sentiments can be said for the visuals. I mean, just look at this. But not all the visuals were that obnoxious. The mod makes very creative use out of the assets that are already in the game to give a sense of what's going on. Not to mention there's a lot of new, unique texture we're going on that at least set the mod apart as being its own thing. So the direction of the scenes is probably the best aspect of how this storyline was laid out. The modders did a fantastic job of utilizing the engine that they had to the point where they did things that not even the sequel game bothered to do. The use of the camera, the dialogue, timing, character animations, everything worked in tandem with each other, just pushed this experience so much further than the previous dozen hours you may have spent on the main campaign. It was truly something even replaying it now, despite how dated the game is. So considering that the storyline is only accessible coming near the end game, the challenges posed by all the fights are fairly substantial. I got through it on the hardest difficulty, which was somewhat tricky at times, but that's with having a character who was a soldier and Jedi Guardian. The respectable difficulty was definitely a plus for an experienced Knights of the Old Republic player, but there were a couple instances where fights were just really long rather than being really difficult. I can't say how much easier or harder things would have been for a different character class, especially since there were a lot of solo sections for your protagonist. There also happen to be sections where you need to play as members of the new cast, but since I was able to get through them without too much issue on the highest difficulty, normal difficulty, it should be no problem. There aren't too many instances of choice in this expansion that will contribute to any significant change of events, but considering it's a completely new isolated experience, it's not a big deal. The mod repurposes a lot of the old assets from the main game, but there's also a healthy amount of new or altered elements scattered here and there. There's access to new equipment, implementation of some new textures, and even a couple new area modules which are for the most part unused areas that were already in the code of the main game. It actually genuinely surprised me that there were optional quests available to the player in the new areas on Korriban. I'm pretty sure I missed at least one in my playthrough, but eh, what can you do? When it comes right down to it, the levels in Kotar are pretty much just walkable areas, hallways going from A to B, with a few bigger sections in between. There's no platforming to make these things stand out, so a lot of the groundwork is in the aesthetics. The mod often has you enter an area from a completely different point than you would have in the original game's implementation to the point where you might almost not even recognize where you are. I'd recommend not thinking too hard about it if you don't want to ruin your immersion. If you do though, on the bright side, ruining your immersion might just help you to navigate the maps a lot faster. As abridged as it was, I genuinely love this storyline, specifically in how it compares to the experience of the main game. It explores more of the protagonist's life in a way that's relevant and makes sense while having something grandiose and present day to focus on as a consequence to her actions. In some ways, it feels like a grander bookend to the actual game's ending, but in other ways, it really is just a very ambitious fan mod. So my final verdict? If anything, if you're a big Knights of the Old Republic fan and you want some new Knights of the Old Republic content, this mod was definitely worth the playtime. Anyway, that's it. Bye.